Hello everyone, welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch and tour. My name is Laís and I am a master's student with Peter Balincurdy and Jim Holland. I have the pleasure to introduce you the next speaker, a man that is not only great at what he does, but he's also following his destiny to be a breather. But how does he know that? Because when he was only 11 years old, he was already a prodigy animal breeder. He won the Irish Texo Sheep Breed Society National Stock Judging Competition. Now, Professor John Hickey is the Chair of Animal Breeding at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh. His area of research spans animal breeding, plant breeding, and human genetics. In particular, he seeks to develop computational methods to generate and analyze huge data sets with whole genome sequence information. He also develops methods and breeding strategies that use genomic information to increase rates of genetic progress. The concepts of genomic selection 2.0 software and algorithms developed by John Hickey underpin aspects of several of the largest breeding programs globally. Please welcome Don Hickey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come here. It's my first time in North Carolina State, and it's very nice to come to a place that has such a, a long and storied history in, in quantitative genetics and breeding. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we might think about exploiting modern technology in breeding programs. So I'll have a little bit about strategies, a little bit about enabling algorithms, some simulated results, some empirical analysis, and I'll take the opportunity to advertise some software. Uh, so everybody in this room knows what a breeding program looks like, but I need to start somewhere, so I, I start here. So in, in an idealized breeding program, we have essentially two pieces. We have a population improvement piece where we test, select, cross, test, and we repeat this process as quickly and as accurately as possible. Then periodically we extract out of this population improvement component a product and disseminate that to farmers in some way. Uh, when we do breeding we're really interested in response to selection and that's very simple. We have this parental generation which we sort according to some metric. We select the top portion of individuals, we mate them and they become the, par they become the parents of the next generation and we shift the mean of the population along by some unit and we call this response to selection. If we do this repeatedly over many generations, we get this cumulative, permanent, permanent and in quite often spectacular increases in, in performance. So currently, the gold standard way in which we rank these individuals is, is genomic selection. Uh, genomic selection is a very simple idea. You have a set of individuals that are phenotyped and genotyped. You use this data to develop a, a black box prediction equation. This prediction equation has no biological interpretation, if you like. It's just good at predicting. You can take that prediction into equation into a set of individuals who are just genotyped and then rank them quite accurately if you do things well. Uh, when we work in breeding, we, as, as Janelle said this morning, we, we operate with the breeder's equation, which is again very simple. We have our response or our genetic gain is a function of accuracy, uh, selection intensity, diversity and time. I like to visualize it in this way, so we have time going along in generations. Uh, we can pop in our genetic variants at some point. I, I depict it here as haplotypes, where each haplotype in the founder generation gets a, a unique color. Then over time, I start to select on these haplotypes, recombine them so that I reach some point over here, which ideally would be an idiotype. Another way of looking at the same thing is that my genetic variants depicted this, this way, so I have 100% of my variants here. I start to select on that variance and I lose it but I turn it over time into genetic gain. And if I play with the parameters of the breeder's equation, I can change the shape of these curves. Ideally, I want this to be linear and I want this to be completely flat. So I don't want to exhaust my genetic diversity, I want to preserve it. Uh, genomic selection in the context of the breeder's equation is attractive for, because it directly addresses three of the four parameters. So you can increase the accuracy of selection with genomic prediction. A genomic prediction, because you don't have to wait for phenotypes, allows you to reduce the generation interval. 
And finally, because genomic selection is typically cheaper than phenotyping, you can increase the selection intensity for a fixed budget. Just to, to visualize how genomic selection could impact the four parameters of the breeder's equation, I've got the four parameters here on this picture, so selection intensity, accuracy, genetic variance, and generation interval. On each axis, I've got um, genetic gain here and the generation going from 1 to 20 here. So what we see is selection intensity is not that attractive a parameter to go after if I want to maximize my genetic gain because I can get some increase as I go from selecting 20% of the individuals to 10% of the individuals, but once I go beyond that, there isn't a whole lot more extra benefit to, to be had by really pressing the selection intensity button. If I look at accuracy, going from an accuracy of 0 0.1 to an accuracy of 0.5, I get a huge jump in response to selection. And if we think about the economics, it's probably not that expensive to construct a training set that gives me an accuracy of 0.5, so I can press this button. But if I want to go beyond that, let's say from 0.5 to 0.7, or ultimately from 0.7 to 1, yes, I get more gain, but it's, quite, it's going to be extremely expensive to construct a genomic selection training set that gives me such high levels of accuracy. If I look at generation interval, so I can have my generation interval, let's say, in some species by having a genomic predictor because I don't need to wait for phenotypes. And if I have my generation interval, I get twice the amount of genetic gain per unit time. So in species where it's possible to really go after cycle time, this is really where gen genomic selection has a role to play. Genomic selection doesn't affect the, the, the genetic variance, but I, I can affect it through other means. And if I just take three different starting values of genetic variance, I get this, if you like, linear increase in genetic gain as I increase my variance. But again, in the context of an investment setting, increasing variance is probably something that's quite expensive to do. So perhaps it's not a good thing to button to try and press if I want to affect my response to selection per unit cost. So genomic selection is now an extremely well-established technology in many species. So if we take, for example, the U.S. Holstein dairy cattle genetic evaluation, this is probably the most mature uh, breeding program that is driven by genomics. So in the old days, they would have an accuracy of 0.5 uh, for an unphenotyped individual uh, based on a pedigree prediction. With their now, now with their genomic predictions, they're able to predict the, these, these, these individuals' values with a 0.86 accuracy. Uh, so this, this level of accuracy can be achieved for an individual animal with about a $15 investment because currently in the dairy industry it costs about $15 to genotype an individual. So this stuff really works and to give you a, a level of the indication of the trust that the industry places in this, one of the big breeding companies purchased a, geno a bull which just had a genomic predictor for about six months ago for about a million dollars. So there are big businesses that really trust genomic predictions. But in certain sectors, it might not be possible to achieve the levels, high levels of accuracy that these guys are achieving. So maybe in your particular breeding program, you can only achieve a 0.1 prediction accuracy, a 0.5, or indeed a 0.86. But this might still be enough for you to, to obtain um, benefit from it. And you really need to, to interpret that in the context of the entire breeder's equation. So what is every unit of accuracy worth to you, and therefore is it worth your while pursuing a genomic selection approach? Two examples of, of how different industries have utilized genomic selection in different ways. So this is the, on this axis I've got genetic gain for the Dutch dairy industry over a period of time. They adopted genomic selection in 2008. The purple line is their average uh, total merit index of all of the profitability, uh, all of the how genetics impacts the profitability on Dutch dairy herds. And you can see they were making a, a rate of gain of 21 points per year in the seven years prior to the adoption of genomic selection. After they adopted genomic selection, this went to 34 points per year, so this is a 60% increase. And since, since 2012, they've gone on and had a further expansion in that increase as genomic selection has started, started to bed down. Uh, over here, we've got a genetic rate of genetic gain from the largest pig breeding program globally. Uh, so after they adopted genomic selection in late 2012, they got this initial bump, and then they continued with a 35% increase in the rate of genetic gain. That has subsequently become 45%. Uh, these two different sectors, uh, pigs and, and, and cattle, harnessed two different aspects of the breeder's equation. So in dairy cattle, generation interval was traditionally very long, it was about five years. That's now come down to about half of what it used to be. So they've really gone after time over here with some penalty on accuracy. 
Over here in the pig industry, generation interval was already at its biological limit, almost, on the male side at least. So what they've done is they've harnessed increased accuracy, particularly for, for traits re related with female performance late in the life, so female longevity, female fertility. And again, if you're thinking about your breeding program, you need to think about how, uh, which parts of the breeder's equation will I affect with genomic selection if I was to adopt it. So what about genomic selection in crops? Well, there are several different roles, and I've highlighted them in different colors because they, uh, they have different categories. So these are kind of obvious statements. Let's say I could have screening of early generation individuals, so I could screen my F2s. I could do recurrent selection of my F2s. I could just broadly speaking recycle individuals early, earlier. I could start to select for hard to measure traits all the way through the breeding program rather than having this series of independent culling events which have been traditionally used in many plant breeding programs. I could improve the accuracy of my field trials by incorporating a genomic relationship matrix first in the design of those trials but then in the analysis of those trials. I can pair my crosses and select within my crosses in some way. At the next level, I can think about reducing the number of years of testing I might do in my breeding program. I can reduce the number of replicates per location. I can re reduce the number of locations. Or I could think about, in the extreme, only phenotyping a portion of my individuals and relying on genomic predictors to fill in the, fill in the missing information. At a higher level, I think all of this would catalyze the total reorganization of plant breeding programs. It might catalyze the adopt, ad adoption of computational decision making, so in, at least in the public sector plant breeding programs that I'm familiar with, uh, computational decision making is, is not ubiquitous. It is ubiquitous in animal breeding programs. It might also catalyze establishing of written down breeding goals with written down economic weights on the different component traits and then breeding to those targets which would have other benefits like being able to measure performance of your breeding program over a long time. And finally, it might catalyze the unification of resources for breeding, pre-breeding, and biological discovery. So your genomic selection training set with millions of individuals, if you're a large breeding program, would become a, a very powerful GWAS discovery set. And all of this stuff basically collapses into the three cliched uh, versions of what genomic selection can do. It can reduce your cycle time, it can increase your selection intensity, and it can increase your accuracy. So I'm going to talk about a study we did, a simulation study we did recently, which we called a two-part strategy for using genomic selection to develop inbred lines. If you want the full details, you can read the pros in crop science, or you can read the hyperbole in nature genetics. Uh, so this simulation basically compared four different strategies, and we equalized the strategies based on time and cost so that we were then able to compare genetic gain per unit time and per unit cost. Uh, and we did very, various versions of this. I'm just going to pre prevent, present a, a single version, but all of the versions give essentially the same rankings of, of, the, of the different strategies. So the basic strategy was for a wheat breeding program where we made a certain number of crosses. It was modeling a sort of moderately large UK private sector wheat breeding program. It made some number of crosses. You do your selfing. You, you know, you eventually get to hedgerows, you eventually get to PYTs, AYTs, and then in a conventional scheme you would recycle back from these hundred lines that get to the advanced yield trial stage, you recycle the best ones back to the crossing block to become the parents of the next generation. Uh, the first version of genomic selection is kind of a typical one that many people are considering or have already implemented. You could start to genotype your PYT stage. Uh, and the advantage of doing, and then recycling parents from this. So the advantage of doing this is that your genomic predictor helps you to increase the accuracy of advancing from here to here, but it also increases your selection intensity and shortens your generation interval for recycling. So instead of taking N from 100, you're now going to take N from 1,000, and you're going to do it one year earlier. However, if you do this, potentially your accuracy reduces because your AYTs will be more accurate. A more extreme version of this is to go to the head row stage. So now, instead of taking n from 100, you're going to take n from 6,500, and you're going to do that two years earlier. But because these head rows don't have any phenotypic information on them, the accuracy will be certainly lower than what it is at the AYT stage. But you're hoping that your genomic predictor would be able to fill back in that accuracy. So these are three basically standard ways to think about two, two versions of genomic selection and one version of um, uh, conventional breeding. 
but a, an animal breeder looking at plant breeding programs thinks that actually this might not be the most optimal way to do it and instead what might be better is to explicitly split the breeding program into what we call a population improvement component and a product development component. The product development component would be as is a, in an ordinary breeding program as, as has always been done and would be operated in accordance with best standard practices that have, are well established in plant breeding. The population improvement component would involve rapid cycling based on recurrent genomic selection. You just spin this as quickly as you can. In our simulation, we assumed two cycles per year. Then every year, once a year, you would extract parents from this out into to become parents of crosses that would establish products. The, the phenotypes that would be collected in this product development component would be accumulated into a training set, and that training set information would be fed back into here to drive this genomic selection. So given we equalized these different breeding schemes based on cost, we were able, and, and they also had a, we simulated a 40 year time frame, we were able to compare the genetic gains uh, on an equal basis. So here I've got the 40 years of gain. This is genetic merit. The conventional scheme is the black line, so it went for 20 years and then it continued for a further 20 years. After the first 20 years, the breeder had the option to, to switch their breeding program to one of the three versions of genomic selection. So what we see is we get an initial increase from in, in gain when we switch to genomic selection, but that the increase of, the rate of increase of genetic gain is not that, the, this slope of this line is not that different to this line with this um, PYT, so the standard, if you like, the standard way people are thinking about doing genomic selection is not that spectacularly better once you discount this initial bump. Going to the head row stage gives us a slightly better slope, but you know, it's, it's not hugely different once you strip away this, this initial bump. Uh, the two part we think is different because it, it, it doesn't have this initial bump which then disappears, the initial bump stays, and ultimately over time you get something like three and a half times more genetic gain per unit time and per unit cost with this version of genomic selection than you do with a standard breeding program. If we look at the dynamics that underpin that, so this is the picture I had on the previous graph. This is the accuracy of selection. So what we see is the conventional breeding program is quite accurate, as we would expect. The different versions of genomic selection have different accuracies, and particularly this two-part scheme, the accuracy of that drops off pretty quickly. And the reason that happens is that our training set is not massive. It's just what we would typically be able to generate in a breeding program. And there's a property to do with genomic prediction training sets known as relatedness that uh, you know, erodes, as it relatedness erodes, the accuracy erodes. So this is something that we would need to solve. A second thing we would need to solve is, is the loss of variance. So this is the variance in the conventional scheme and you can say once you account for the Bulmer, so this is something you wouldn't need to worry about. It basically, it's not too bad in terms of loss of variance from your breeding program. Uh, when you go to the, to the genomic selection schemes, you get this sudden drop, but this is explained by going from Inbred in, fully inbred individuals to outbred individuals and the halving of the genetic variance, so you just need to discount that. But what you do notice is that the, um, the, the, the two-part scheme is eroding variance at a faster rate than the conventional scheme. So there are a number of ways that you could solve that. The first one would be to integrate a pre-breeding scheme here in some way, and, and, and we're working on that, but we don't have it fully optimized yet. Uh, there's a second way which I'll talk about in a moment, but first I want to just skip to here. So this type of a framework could be connected all together in, in, in a sort of an interconnected information and germplasm exchange uh, and integration program that could serve, for example, the whole of the US. So you would have a, a national rapid cycling program that would be borrowing phenotypic information from all of the different <laughs> sites. It would be sending germplasm appropriately to all of the different sites. And I think about this as being a little bit like a mechanical clock, so you have all these wheels and they all need to spin at different rates so that the germplasm is being pushed out and mixed up in an appropriate way. We've done some simulations where this has been adapted to, for example, a strawberry breeding program, which would have less resources than a large UK wheat breeding program, so a very small training set, a few hundred individuals, and, and the model translates as soon as you account for some of the, some of the factors. Uh, so, as I said, we only assumed two cycles per year here, and this is pretty conservative, and perhaps with speed breeding, which is getting a lot of publicity recently, you could increase the number of cycles per year, and we sort of thought, well, if you did that, you might get a linear increase in response to selection. Uh, 
So we did a simulation uh, where we kept, um, we, we just increased the number of cycles per year from one all the way up to 12, but we kept the, the total resources per annum constant in terms of plants per cycle, or a total plant. So when you increase the number of, of cycles per year, you need to discount the number of plants that you can have per cycle to keep the costs equal. And what we see is that if this is where we get you know, one cycle per year, we get this linear increase. If we go increase the number of cycles per year, we get these, you know, initially these massive increases in genetic gain, but very quickly we exhaust our genetic variance. Uh, and we, 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 this, so this pro process doesn't work essentially, uh, which was a bit disappointing. So then we set about trying to solve that problem and we again resorted to, to classic animal breeding tricks to do that. But before I do that, I want to show you um, you know, in, in breeding, as everybody knows, genetic variance is a very important thing. And we've got two breeding programs here, which run for, I think it's for 80 generations. And in one of them, we're selecting 20% of the individuals to be parents, and in the other, we're selecting 1% of the individuals to be parents. And as the, as the generations clock up, you see the, the aggressive breeding program starts to push ahead of the, of the, um, the more conservative program. And I wish I speeded this up a bit because I, I always have to stand here like this. I thought, of, I thought about making a joke that this could be the Clemson breeding program and this could be the NC State one. But. <laughs> so I guess people like Jim Holland know what's going to happen here, right? So the aggressive breeding program pretty quickly, well not pretty quickly, but you know, it runs out of genetic ver diversity at some point and, and the other breeding program just continues to go on and it goes on all the way. So this is kind of well established theory, but I think it's sometimes good to look at, at the diversity and, and just see what happens. So we set about solving this in the context of our two-part breeding scheme where we wanted to have more than two cycles per year. We wanted to get to, let's say, eight cycles per year. And we, uh, we basically borrowed well-established methods from animal breeding, which are, it's called optimized, optimal contribution selection. And we developed a piece of software to implement that and we've tested it in the context of a, of a wheat breeding program. So this is how it looks like. So the, the breeder's dilemma is the breeder wants to maximize genetic gain and minimize um, loss of diversity or keep, the, you know, keep as much of the diversity in the population as possible. So the breeder can be risky where they just forget about diversity and go after entirely after genetic gain. And we see that if you do that, you, you crash, your breeding program will crash pretty quickly. If you're in charge of a zoo, you don't want to make any genetic gain. You just want to keep all of the diversity that's possible. Uh, but ideally, you would be here in some point where it's a balancing the two things appropriately. And the way to do that is with optimal contribution selection, where you maximize genetic gain, minimize uh, loss of diversity, and you do this subject of practical constraints. And the way in which we do that is solving this equation, and this equation has a few simple things. So x, the vector x, are the vector of contribution. So it's the proportion of matings that a particular parent gets in, in a particular generation. Um, E here would be the breeding value, so then X prime E will become the genetic gain. It's an estimate of the genetic gain in the next generation. Big A is the relationship amongst the individuals, so this piece of, of, the, of the system would be pro approximating group co-ancestry or future inbreeding, if you like, future diversity in your breeding program. So you want to minimize this and maximize this. And you can choose, the way to do that is, is setting up this frontier. This will be from a particular data set. And we chose that we wanted to be at this point here. And our optimization algorithm just moves around the, the contributions and moves around the, the matings so that we get, we hit this point. Uh, to do, when you do that, you get a solution that looks like this. So these are the individual IDs. This is the genetic merit of the individuals. This is their average co-ancestry. And these are their, their, the proportion of the matings that they get. So this guy gets eight matings and this guy gets four matings. And just to illustrate the point, if you look, the top individual has a, has a lower genetic merit than the second individual, and that's because the top individual is less, has less inbreeding than, the, than this guy, for example. So we put that exact algorithm into the context of our two-part scheme, uh, and this is what we got. So here is our conventional um, breeding program with, um, without optimal contributions. So that would be our conventional two-part genomic selection scheme. But if we exploit optimal contributions in that, 
we don't get this asymptoting property of, of response to selection. We're getting, it's not linear, but it's, it's much more like where you want it to be. So if you put that together, instead of saying we get six times more, or three times more genetic gain per unit time and per unit cost, we can say we get six times more genetic gain per unit time and per unit cost by putting these two technologies together. Um, so, so now I'll move on a little bit in, in the genomic selection recipe. So uh, it's a pretty simple recipe. You know, we need to build a large and diverse training set. We need to maximize the relationships between the training and prediction sets. We need to test many candidates. We need to recycle quickly, etc. And we need to do all of this within the context of the breeder's equation. But the classical breeder's equation, it's missing one piece. We think it should also in, in involve cost because you know, not only is time a constraint, but cost is a constraint. And in the context of genomic selection, there are two costs. The first one is you know, the, the phenotyping and genotyping costs associated with building a large training set. And the second one is the genotyping cost associated with testing many candidates, because for every candidate you want to test, you need to genotype it. So fortunately, the recipe to solve this is, is again well established and pretty simple. You can just harness the family structure of plant breeding programs. So in plant breeding programs, we have very few parents with very many progeny. So a simple thing to do would be genotype the parents at high density uh, and genotype lots of their progeny with low density and use imputation to fill in the missing information. And again, this is pretty established technology in several sectors. So this is something we did in, in an animal breeding context where we were, wor were working with a breeding program that produced 100,000 candidates per year that it want to evaluate. The manager of the breeding program told us he would only spend $2.2 million a year on genotyping and we had to make genomic selection work within that cost constraint. Uh, so he, he said, well, we have 480 sires of these 100,000 and we have 12,000 dams per year. And th at the time, these were the costs of genotyping. Uh, so a simple strategy was to say, okay, sires have lots of progeny, let's just genotype all the sires at 60K and we can offset the cost of doing that by dividing the cost of genotyping the sire by the number of progeny. That turns out it's 58 cents per progeny to have the sire genotyped at 60K. Then the, the, the females themselves, they can be genotyped at anything between 384 and 60K and the candidates equally. And you can put all of the combinations of those scenarios in. Uh, each of these different things produces different costs. Uh, when we run the imputation algorithms that we developed, we got different imputation accuracies going from 0.94 up to perfect imputation if everybody was genotyped with the high density. We then produced breeding values with the true high density markers and then reproduced the breeding values with the imputed high density markers and we called the correlation between those two breeding values as information retained in imputed genotyped driven breeding values. So when you're genotyped at 60K, you, in, you retain all of the information. When you're genotyped at 384, you, you retain 90% of the information. We then took this equation, this, this numbers, and plugged it into the breeder's equation to work out a response per unit cost. And if you see, it's cost, when you genotype everybody at 60K, at, at that time, very expensive cost, you were getting, let's say, one unit of genetic gain. But if you, if you follow this low, low, dense, low cost genotyping strategy, you would get 5.26 units of genetic gain more per unit cost. Um, and that all makes sense because the genotyping cost is about, you know, it's about five times, uh, let's say, approximately. So we, we just wanted to apply the exact same logic in a plant breeding context. So unfortunately in plant breeding there are not that many publicly available genotype imputation algorithms. Um, so we had to develop our own and this particular one we developed for the situation where the parents are inbred and the progeny would be F1s, F2s, F3s or double haploid derived versions of those. Uh, so this algorithm, it's, I don't want to go into the details because it will be a whole presentation in itself, but it's basically a series of heuristics that, that capture linkage information. And on this axis, I've got the genotype imputation accuracy, and on this axis, I've got the number of SNPs per chromosome. So if you look, let's say, 10 SNPs per chromosome, we're getting almost perfect imputation accuracy, and that would translate to almost perfect imputation accuracy all of the way up to whole genome sequence information if the parents were sequenced. Um, it pretty quick, it runs in 17 seconds per individual and it's parallelizable, etc., etc. So we wanted to just look at that in, in the plant breeding context, but in the context of return on investment. So this would be genetic gain measured by return on investment. Uh, 
the baseline is when we have a, our genomic selection training set and the selection candidates, both genotyped at high density, so both genotyped with 20,000 SNPs. If I go along this line here, this would be saying I continue to genotype my training set at high density, but I genotype my candidates with sets of lower, lower numbers of markers, and I do imputation. So when, by playing with the genotyping of and making genotyping costs of selection candidates cheap, is not giving you that much more return on investment because you can't hammer selection intensity so much. Selection intensity is not a button that is worth pressing a lot, mm -hmm. uh, at least from the perspective of population improvement. It might be different from product development. Uh, so then we, we, we did the other thing, which was starting here and keeping the selection candidates genotyped at high density, but genotyping the training set at low density and pushing increasing, recovering the missing information with imputation. And when you start to do that, you get, you know, pretty okay returns on investments, doubling the rate of genetic gain, if you like, per unit cost. But when you put the two things together, you get this big jump, going to something like six times more genetic gain per unit cost. Of course, this will be highly dependent upon the particular assumptions we made about number of candidates, size of training set, etc. But I think it illustrates the principle that genotyping you, you know, if you think about it in terms of return on investment and you do it with low density, it might be interesting. And the papers are there for anybody that's interested. So now I'll go to my, my second last piece of this talk, which is, uh, you know, the principles of the design of genomic selection training sets. Uh, but before I go there, I just want to make one point. So imagine this is my training set here and these are my prediction guys, the, the, the solid lines. Uh, if I did a random cross-validation study of the prediction of these guys, I would get a prediction, you know, my, my slope or my line would tell me my prediction accuracy is 0.78. But if I went to my colleague that's a breeder and got their pedigree, their pedigree would tell me that this is family A and this is family B. And then my ge genomic prediction accuracy within these families is actually not, not that spectacular. It's 0.22. And this is important because if, I, if my genomic selection and my measure of accuracy of genomic selection is actually biased upward, as I demonstrated by, um, uh, by the data structure, I, and I select on that, I'll do population replacement, which is a bad thing to do. What I want to do is population improvement, and to do that I need to exploit the Mendelian sampling term, which is what we call within family genetic variation. So my accuracy of selection is really the accuracy of genomic prediction within that family, that 0.22 number. Uh, it's this exploiting this that is what's driving genetic gain. So when we see lots of papers validating genomic selection, you need to always interpret them. Are they doing, are they doing this or are they doing this? So the principles of establishing genomic selection training sets are pretty simple. You need to, first thing you need to do is maximize the relationships between the selection candidate here and the individuals in the training set. The second thing you need to do is, having, having done this, you need to minimize the relationship amongst the, 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 the training set individuals. So this is old-fashioned QTL experimental design, having lots of diversity in your experimental discovery, QTL discovery data set gives you better ability to fine map the QTL. It's the same mechanics that would underlie genomic selection. So we set up a very simple simulation to try and quantify no, approximate numbers in, to achieve certain levels of accuracy in a plant breeding context. So we have this biparental which we call BPX uh, and we want to work within that so we want to quantify how accurate we are at separating sister lines within that biparental. We can do that by having a training set which is encompassing some information that we collect within this biparental. It could encompass information that is collected from families that have parents in common with this biparental, that have grandparents in common with this biparental, or which are nominally unrelated but which come from the same training set. And there were lots of scenarios, but the, the simple message is here I've got SNP density, uh, here I've got accuracy of, of within, Mendelian sampling accuracy, so a, accuracy within the family uh, and on this axis or these these colors are the number of individuals I have in my in my each of the families that I use to do my ge genomic selection training so let's say I wanted to hit an accuracy of 0.6 when I train my genomic selection training set within this focal biparental family called X I need 50 individuals and 200 markers to hit an accuracy of 0.6 there is a problem that this is subject to a large sampling variance, which means it will work in some families and it will not work in other families. 
If I go to a, a situation where I've got parents in common with this target biparental, my 0.6 accuracy can be achieved with about 800 individuals and 400 markers, so something along here. If I go to a situation in which the individuals are nominally unrelated, so they're coming from the same breeding pool but they don't have parents or grandparents in common, to achieve my accuracy of 0.6, I need 10,000 markers and somewhere between 6 and 20,000 individuals. Ultimately, this is where we want to get to because if we get to here, this is a broad, broad applicability in terms of a genomic selection training set. If I am here, it, I do not benefit from time and I, I have to invest in ev for every family, whereas here I, I just invest for the breeding program. So we wanted to quantify this simulation with a field experiment, so we proceeded with um, establishing a, a design which involved 44 crosses from the UK elite UK wheat breeding programs. We took from each of those 68 F2 individuals, we made F2 derived F4 plots from those guys, and we phenotyped those plots four times in two locations over two years. Uh, after genotyping and doing the QC, we had 25,000 SNPs. Uh, as you might expect, the UK breeders share parents all the time, so the crosses are all related to each other, but we were able to choose crosses that have some relationships, some shared parents, some, some shared grandparents, etc. Uh, we then analyzed this data and the first result I'll show you is um, if we calculated the accuracy by doing a standard cross-validation where we just randomly sampled from across the whole data set and predicted it, we got an accuracy of 0.54 which is interesting but of course this is biased upward by having structure and family mean differences embedded within it. If we then masked individual crosses and used the, the rest of the data to predict those crosses, the accuracy was much lower of order 0.125. Uh, we then went and divided up the data set in various ways uh, and produced this result. So here I've got the accuracy of prediction and here I've got the number of blues in the training set. So as I increase the number of blues in the training set I get an increase in the accuracy. If I do it focus just on individuals that are unrelated to the focal cross, uh, my accuracy is, is low but nonetheless it increases. If I focus with the green line just on individuals that are related to the cross, so these would have parents in common with the cross, uh, you know, I get a higher level of accuracy and it increases as I um, add more data. And then finally, if I mix both related and unrelated individuals, I get you know, a, a better level of accuracy. The next thing we did was take some of three quarters of the individuals from the focal cross and added them to the data set, uh, added it to this data. So now the data became stuff from other crosses plus some number of individuals from the focal cross to predict unphenotyped individuals in the focal cross. And by doing that, we, we were again, as one would expect, able to increase the accuracy. So overall, I think for a data set with 3,000 individuals, these are, these are not bad levels of accuracy. The main messages are that you know, more records yields better predictions. Using related crosses as a training set was better than using unrelated stuff. This is all well established. Uh, and then adding unrelated stuff contributes less than if I add related stuff. Um, so the final topic I want to talk about today is, is genome editing. Uh, so I believe this, the next speaker is going to talk about that in more detail. Uh, so it, this is just a simulation study that we did a few years ago because at that time genome editing was and still is getting a lot of publicity in, in the big journals, etc. So we wanted to see what could it do uh, for, for breeding programs, but not from the perspective of simple traits like a disease trait, but rather from the perspective of quantitative trait like yield. Uh, so when we were in high school biology, they taught us that genetics works like this. There's a single gene and it is fully penetrant and it controls the trait, so you end up with three outcomes. Uh, as we went further in our education, we learned that actually there are more genes and ultimately when we become animal breeders, we, we learned that um, Everything is a quantitative trait, so there are thousands of genes affecting these traits. Each of these genes have a very small effect, uh, and we assume, because we're just simple animal breeders, that they all act additively. Uh, so in the context of traits like that, we wanted to look at what genome editing could do. So we, co we call this strategy PAGE, which stands for the promotion of alleles by genome editing. And the reason we chose this terminology was we wanted to emphasize that we are taking existing alleles within our population and using editing to increase the frequency. And this is different from going into our 
in other germplasm or other species and pulling an allele and introducing it into a, using genome editing to introduce it, if you like, novel genetic variation. This is simply speeding up what a breeder is trying to do anyway, which is increase the frequency of favorable alleles. So we wanted to quantify how many alleles we would need to edit per generation and how many animals we would need to edit per generation to, you know, to get significant impact on our rate of genetic gain. So the simulation was as follows. We have uh, 100,000 years of random mating to reflect natural evolution of, of livestock. We then did 20 years of historical breeding where we had genomic selection with perfect accuracy where we would select 25 sires and 500 females per generation to become the parents of the next generation. Uh, we then did future breeding, 20 years of future breeding, where we continued genomic selection. But when we would get a selected, a sire that was selected, we could choose to edit that individual. We could choose to edit all of the 25 sires. We could choose to edit the top five, the top 10, the bottom five. And we could choose to edit those guys for anywhere between zero and 100 alleles per, per animal. Uh, this trait is controlled by 10,000 causal variants. Their effects are sampled from a normal distribution, so in a QTN mapping sense, there are no big effect QTN here. So uh, again, we have this genetic gain represented by 40 years of, of generations, and the genetic gain is here. The conventional scheme, the historical conventional scheme is going like this, and then it continues onwards into the future. Then these extra lines represent whether I edit the sires for one allele, 5, 10, 20. But if we look at the 20, we see that we get a doubling of genetic gain. By, so this trait is controlled by 10,000 causal variants. And by doing what I would consider a modest amount of genome editing, we can double the rate of genetic gain. You'll also see that the conventional scheme is starting to asymptote, whereas the genome editing scheme is having less of an asymptote property. So if you like. Genome editing is more efficient at turning genetic variation into genetic gain, which is something that I think is interesting. And to understand how that works, we have here the allele frequencies on this axis and here the 40 generations. Uh, the solid lines are what happens to all the average allele frequency of all 10,000 loci. And what you see, whether you're doing the genome editing approach in red or the, the conventional scheme in blue, uh, there isn't much difference in the change in, in allele frequencies by those two approaches on average. And also, there, there isn't really that much of a difference. We're not really shifting allele frequencies that much over 40 years. But if you look at the top QTN, so the, here I've got the two lines, uh, one for the conventional approach and one for the genome editing approach, where I just took the 20 QTN, which had the largest absolute effect. And so what happens to the allele frequencies of those? So what we see is that the conventional breeding scheme is able to increase the frequency of those quite a bit, but then we hit an asymptote. And the reason we're hitting that asymptote is because due to linkage drag and small effective population size, we're losing, I think it's four out of the 20 of these big effect alleles from our population before our breeding program can drive them to fixation. But with the genome editing scheme, of course, we don't lose those. We, within three or four generations, drive them to fixation, and we move on to the next set of alleles. So I appreciate that this is a simulation, um, but if it was to work in practice, uh, you know, a key parameter is how many causal variants would I need to discover? So across the 20 generations, we edited 314 distinct alleles, a distinct QTN, out of the 10,000, so a very small amount. Um, these 314 QTN explain about 36% of the base population. Uh, and, and we think that mapping these is within the scope of, our, of the data sets that we have in livestock, where we've got a few million animals with genotypes in every species at this stage. Uh, and you know, if you divide this number by, by 20, you, you basically need to have 15. You need to discover 15 causal variants per year, per generation, to double your genetic gain. So I, I then start, start, started to think, well, how would we go about doing that? So we call this allele testing for a reason I'll explain in a minute. So if the goal is to double the genetic gain over a 20 year period, let's say, we need to find about 15 small effect polygenic QTN per generation. And as the opening remarks said this morning, we're not going to do this if we do it by a gene by postdoc approach. So how about we uh, take a quantitative geneticist's solution to molecular biology? and take a dirty approximation in high throughput, which is what quantitative geneticists do. Uh, 
So make an assumption, just to simplify, supposing I've got 10,000 variants that affect yield, I'm just going to worry about the 1,000 of these that I imagine have got simple additive effects. So the other 9,000 will be more complex, well I'm going to leave that to the molecular biologist. I'm going to hope that there's a thousand that are pretty simple in their mechanism. And I want to find these. So in the old days of animal breeding, we, we did progeny testing schemes, that was the way we did breeding. And just for to make that connection, perhaps in the future we'll have this allele testing scheme where I can uh, essentially apply, employ a plant breeder's breeding funnel where I fill it, f sort of pour in at the top 25 million, million segregating sites or whatever it is in the genome and then I want to use these technologies to sort of narrow down my search space so that in the end I have my, my alleles that might actually work. Just to put numbers on that, so it's all about you know, gaming the odds. So I start with my 25 million variants, I'm going to assume that 10,000 affect the trait I'm going to assume that 1,000 work in a simple additive way, and out of those 1,000, I want to find 15. So I start with my 25 million. I do GWAS. Let's imagine I narrow the search space to um, a million. Over here, I've got, I want to increase the ratio of what's in my subset to being favorable, if you like. So going from here, I've got you know, 15 out of 25 million. Going from here, I've got 15 out of a million. Over here I want to do a second thing which is increase the probability that anything I edit in the end is not going to be highly deleterious. I don't care if it's neutral, I don't care if it just has a small effect, as long as it's not highly deleterious it's not going to really affect me. So I, I take my GWAS, I increase my odds, I take my EQTL, I increase my odds a little bit more, I do functional annotation, I increase them again, I go into some cell lines, maybe I, I'm down here to a thousand which are highly probable. I put them in, I, I, I'm here with this probability. I then go to in vivo editing of pigs or maize or whatever. I'm getting now to sort of odds that are not too bad. And then finally I put, an hundred, I put 100 alleles into, into my pigs or my maize. Out of these 100, only 15 will work, but I have through this process also guaranteed that the other uh, 85 will not be highly deleterious. And in, in the end, so my edited pigs will, will contain 15 positive small effect causal variants. So I don't know what you guys think of this approach, but this was just something I was thinking about. So that's how we might discover the causal variants in a certain way uh, to, to drive this. But just one last point about that. When we do genome editing, we need to be very careful about what happens to genetic gain. So in this particular situation, I've imagined that I have the resources to do 500 edits per generation. And I can distribute those edits across all of the individuals, all of the sires, so all of the contributing males in my population, or I could focus them uh, and just put them across the top five individuals. So this would be 25 sires each with 20 edits, this would be five sires each with 100 edits. And by focusing my resources on a subset of the animals, I get this massive increase in genetic gain. So instead of having it double, I'm now getting four times more gain. But what's happening also is that I'm getting a massive bump in, in, in inbreeding, which is a bad thing. So here I've got my inbreeding, here I've got my 40 generations, my conventional breeding scheme continues, levels of inbreeding up to there. If I do genome editing where everybody is getting edited, all of the sires are getting edited equally, I don't affect my inbreeding. But if I distribute the edits on a, a number of the individuals, I get this big bump in inbreeding. And what's happening is I'm creating what we call super grand sires. So these guys that are getting edited, they're getting a big push on in terms of their genetic potential. So when the breeding program comes around the next time, it's their progeny that gets to dominate the individuals that get selected. So when you do genome editing, you need to be very careful about exploiting it so that your germplasm is not being you know, narrowed in some way. And again, optimal contribution selection would be the way to, to, to solve that problem. So I'll just conclude with a few wrap-ups. Uh, so I think genomic selection opens the Pandora box for breeding programs. We can think about you know, economic selection indices. We can think about managing genetic diversity globally using optimal contributions. We can think about designing and analyzing our field trials with a genomic relationship matrix so that we get you know, suck more information out. We can have objective, consistent computational decisions. Uh, Inside, there are direct breeding benefits, so breeding and discovery could become the same thing, like to find these genome editing targets. We can hit accuracy, selection intensity. Because we are 
accumulating training data sets over many years in many environments, I think we'll start to invoke a robustness to G by E, which was not possible in the past where the big selection intensity was happening with, let's say, single location trials in many breeding programs. Uh, if we go after shorter generation interval or short, shorter breeding cycle time, I think that's where there's the biggest bang for the book. And potentially we can also reduce the number of years uh, that we would test varieties, but I, I didn't really talk about that. There are many ways to exploit genetic variation. Uh, the two-part strategy can give two to three times more genetic gain per unit time, per unit cost, but it does have this penalty on genetic variance. Optimal contribution can solve that and put this two-part again on a per unit genetic variance perspective also. Uh, I think genome editing could work for yield. Uh, it does need a high throughput discovery strategy, which I think is different to the gene by postdoc approach that was referred to this morning. Uh, it might require resources that go beyond what research environments like universities can do because of the high throughput required. Um, we've used some software in all of this, so this is a simulation program. It's going to go on CRAN <coughs> shortly. This is the optimization algorithm for optimal contribution selection. It's available on our website. And this is our new uh, imputation algorithm for crops. Uh, that's going to be available at some point in the near future. We've received a lot of funding from various organizations. So these will be British government organizations. Uh, these are uh, various animal and plant breeding organizations, uh, particularly Driscoll's, which are funding us to do some work on strawberries. Uh, Monsanto, who are working with us on, on some maize aspects. And then the UK wheat breeding programs with whom we're working with on some wheat projects. Uh, many people have contributed to the work, uh, particularly Gregor, uh, who is here, uh, Chris Gaynor, who is here, um, and uh, Sarat Gunan, who is the person who developed the imputation algorithm. So if there's anybody out there that would like to join our team, uh, we're, we're, we're looking for people. So thank you very much. It's a very nice uh, talk. So I have two questions about genomic selection. When we talk about the genomic selection strategy, and uh, when I look at all these analysis results, I just want to know what kind of method you use to estimate uh, the market effect to do the prediction. It's a GBLAP, it's RRBLAP or Bayesian approach, or some other approach you developed from your team? So uh, a huge amount of literature has, effort has been invested in developing literature comparing genomic prediction models. I think the broad conclusion from that is that no, there is no benefit from using something fancy. Mm -hmm. So we use GBLOP and we have never seen it uh, to not perform well. OK, good. Thank you. Uh, the second question is about assumption, basic assumption when you do the simulation, because I see a very impressive result from your work. I just want to know if, so what's the basic assumption you made for the, uh, for the, for the genetic effect? It's, uh, it's only really made, uh, it's assumption is based on the additive model or additive plus epithesis plus dominance model. That's my second question. Thank you. So we've been simulating for about 10 years now. And if we go back to when we started, we were very concerned about the genetic model and we used to have different models. We had a rare variant model. We had different distributions on QTL effects. We had different numbers of QTLs. Uh, we have evolved to just assuming one genetic model, which is 10,000 causal variants, mm -hmm. uniformly distributed across the genome, with additive effects sampled from a normal distribution. Okay. That we find that that approximates the behavior we see. Yeah. We have recently started to add dominance, yeah. but we have not put epistasis in. And the reason we haven't put epistasis in is because Nobody really understands epistasis, <laughs> yes. and there is no generative model that is going to give us, lot, you know, we validate our, our simulations, let's say we take historical germplasm genetic gain trends for maize, and we hit the targets for 100 years in terms of the additive and the heterotic performance, heterosis, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we do that with those models, whereas if we put in epistasis, we're not able to get anything that behaves like what we see in, in the real data. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, thanks for, thanks for the great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> in the two-stage 
GWS scheme that you had where you had kind of recurrent selection in GWS, um, it looked like you assumed kind of a, a relatively small number of parents and crosses from each stage. And, you know, in some crop species, we can make way more crosses and have way more individuals than that. How effective would that be in, in avoiding the loss of genetic diversity that, that you saw and, and thus limiting your long-term genetic gain? Yeah, this is a fair question. So um, you could do that, and I agree with your intuition that it would be a good thing to do. But uh, we have tried many, many things to play with genetic variation and see how that impacts long-term genetic gain. So a simple thing we did was manipulate recombination rate and assumed it was under genetic control, etc., and select on recombination rate or have genome editing for recombination rate. And we put up a big complicated simulation and we got no benefit. And, and I would argue that what you're implying is effectively just you know, increased recombination rate in some way. So my conclusion from all of this work that we've tried with regard to ex, you know, increasing genetic variance is nothing makes any difference in the short or medium or long term of meaningful amounts except optimal contribution selection. This is the only thing. And even the optimal contribution selection itself is not that spectacular. So I don't know if that answers your question, but they're my thoughts. Just follow up about that point and the mention of OCS. It just looked like there wasn't any trade-off at the beginning in gain under the OCS model. Could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, why would you expect a trade-off? Uh, you are selecting for more unrelated individuals, right? You're trying to avoid the enrichment of a particular... I guess I, I'm wondering if it's like a complementary set of alleles being captured in different um, sets of individuals is what allows that to kind of proceed without any trade-off, as opposed to individuals having a greater yeah. number of positive alleles. I guess I, I, I see where your question is coming from. I hadn't thought about this before, but just thinking while you're speaking, um, you know, we're essentially taking something from this, we're, 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 we're taking it from this point. So in terms of effective population size, this point turns out to be an effective population size of about 12, but that doesn't matter. But if you see here, you know, we're getting, we're not really penalizing gain that much, you know? And given we have a lot more diversity in the next generation, we, we should be immediately able to recover that. So I, I guess intuitively your thinking is correct. This should be a penalty, but in practice, it doesn't turn out to be that case. Hey, John. Thanks for a really good talk. Very thought-provoking. I appreciate it. So have you thought much about this for highly complex asexually propagated crops that, that are, are typically polyploids? I can see where genomic selection can work really well if you want to improve a population for, a, for one or two really key traits. But when it comes down to making a variety, our a successful variety is often a combination of about, you know, 20 plus traits that have to come together in the right shape, form, and alignment to make it successful. And that's where I'm really wrestling with how I would use GS in, in these types of species. I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. So I'll say two things. Um, firstly, uh, I think I really believe this is a sensible model that satisfies a person like you and satisfies a person like me, right? So I want to operate over here, and I trust that a person like you is going to do a good job here. So your role in our joint enterprise is that I'm going to give you parents, and I'm not going to let you choose the parents. You just need to trust me. But inside here, your job is to make sure that the descendants of these parents get cleaned up for bad things, like they're within the parameter space for uh, protein percentage or disease resistance or whatever. And I think there will be enough 
genetic variation within that part to give you options to do your job equally well. Over here, I'll have a multi-trait selection index where I'll get all of the 20 traits that you referred to and I'll economically weight them in accordance with their impact on farm profit or in accordance with what you tell me they should be weighted. Whatever it is. And, and I'll, I'll the germplasm I'll be delivering to you will be you know, increasing the fit of the total population to that target faster than what you can do currently, in, in my view. I was struck by your use of the phrase of describing, af making all of this available, the things that you discussed, as opening Pandora's box. What do you mean by that? Well, so I used to work at CIMIT, um, and yeah, the CIMIT breeding program is great, and it needs to do what it does, but it's a very fixed formula. And it, they cannot take a risk to jump out and try something else because they need to deliver you know, to their stakeholders. Um, but I, think, I actually think if they threw away their box and completely redesigned it, you could get the CIMIT breeding program going four times faster for a half, half the cost. And that, you know, the Pandora box that you're opening is the economic selection index, the rapid cycling, the better design of field trials. So currently field trials are, let's say they're just, you do a random design in some way, but now you would do a non-random design where you put genetic connections between blocks so that you can better now separate the genetics from the environment in a kind of a, a sensible way. You would put a genomic relationship matrix into your ASRAML analysis so that you increase your accuracy by point, you know, 10% or something like that. So uh, then inside in a breeding program, Breeders are very powerful. The breeder has, you know, the last say on what's being selected, what's being advanced, and I would see it as those decisions are quite subjective, and every decision is an independent event in some way. This one, they're making a decision about this individual. Now they make a decision about this individual. I think if you take away the breeder's power and put it, you know, force the breeder to write down, well, my objective is this and this and this, and then you fit the germplasm to that to that prescription you would actually end up with something that's much more objective and systematic than what is at play. Now, I appreciate most people in the room are breeders who probably, don't disagree, who probably absolutely disagree with what I said, but you asked me the question, I'm giving you my answer, okay? Do you disagree? Oh, that might be so. I'm not very good at English. My, my wife is Spanish and my vocabulary has gone very bad. <laughs> So that's all the time we have for questions. The speakers will be around afterwards at the reception if you have any more questions for them.